Burgess here with Music Marketing TV. Today we're going to be looking at some analyzers by Blue Cat Audio, specifically the multi analyzer stuff, because that stuff is my favorite. <laughs> so we're going to check that out. So here we are. I've got this small loop. It's all one synth and it grows and grows and grows. That's the same synthesizer, it just gets bigger and bigger. And so uh, there's a couple different multi analyzers we've got here. So multi analyzer means it's an analyzer that can that can show you multiple channels at the same time. So you can load up more than one of them and they'll be able to see each other. So for example, on the kick, we're gonna load up, the first one we're gonna load up is the scope multi two. Actually, let's start with the frequency analyst because that one I think is the most straightforward. Ironically, it's got the most controls, but it's it's basically a spectrogram that can see a bunch of different things at the same time. And you're given all these options here for what you want the spectrogram to show you. And so I'm going to keep it simple here. You'd pick different ones for different reasons. If you want to make mixing decisions, you're going to want to do uh, averages typically, right? Because you're going to compare averages when you're making meaningful balance decisions. But if you're looking for small clashing moments, possible masking, weird spots that possibly just eat a little more headroom than you'd like for like a split second, then you'd want to use something like peak or something like that to catch those moments and tell which thing is causing the problem. We're just going to go with instant for now. And you can click to name. We're going to name this kick. And that's fine. And we're going to give it the number one. So there's all these different numbers you can give to different things. Uh, if you want to do like multiple channels out at the same time, you can. But a lot of the time, you know, you only need one of them. So I'm just going to go for this one also uh, to keep things moving here. So you can see here's the kick. Now, one thing that I was wondering <laughs> when I did that was how do I get that menu back? It's up here. So if you accidentally close this and you want to rename something, that's how you get to it. You click this little icon up here. So you can see it's labeled kick. And if we play it, you can see it doing its thing. Now, if we really wanted to, we could add a second channel output. I'm not going to name it. We just know it's the kick. And this one will show the peak. And if we play this, you can see it updates at the peak and freezes there, which is really handy for catching any maximum moments and going in and saying, hey, how can I change this? If you hover over it, it's going to tell you, you know, the information that's relevant to this particular spot. Uh, you know, your your frequency, the tuning, and how loud. So you can come in and make adjustments. Uh, now, if you want to take away something, you can just click to hide it, or you can come over and just exit it off. Maybe you have more things that you'd like to use, like more channels, and so you'd rather use that channel for another instrument. You can do that. So, okay, we've got the kick set up. Let's head over to the synth. Let's add a blue cat. We're going to go over, grab the frequency analyst. All right. And oh, this is the frequency analyst pro. It's a bit different. Let's go for the multi version, which is the one just above it. Beautiful. We're going to name this one synth and we'll give it a different color. We'll give it the color for number 16. We'll give it red. Now, when we play it, You can see them both going at the same time. You can fill it too, which can be kind of helpful. You can see where things are clashing. Possible masking problems can become really apparent using this. But what I really like is if you come over to this difference menu, it'll actually show you one minus the other. Now, they're uh, set up already to work a certain way. And there's also some neat things you can do with memory slots that I'm not going to get into here. Uh, but we're going to do the kick minus the synth. And so if the kick is stronger in an area, it's going to appear positive. If the kick is weaker in a certain area of the spectrum, it's going to appear negative. So, which means that the synth has more of that content than the kick does. That's what it means when we do something like this. See right now the kick's owning the high end for the most part. Right now the, uh, the, this is being just dominated by the synth. You can tell because it's, it's mostly negative right here. And as we keep moving along, we can see the synth just completely over. I mean, you can barely hear the kick anyways, but this would show that visually as well. And 
we can see the balance shifts right here. So when you're looking at an analyzer like this, it's sometimes tempting to think that things like this are, are really bad when it's super unbalanced. But if it's in a bigger context of a musical piece and there are balance changes like right there where the kick comes back out, you know, that might actually be an all right thing to have going on. If you want your kick to pound all the way through it, you've got the information and you can go in and you can change that if you want to. Uh, but personally, I think having the kick get drowned out a little bit and having it suddenly come back is extremely cool sounding. So I'd actually keep some of that. I'd probably do something to, to bring the kick up a little bit, but not too much. So that is the frequency analyst and just some of the basic controls uh, that you have here. Now, if you are having CPU performance problems, you can come into precision and you can bring it to a lower precision. The It won't look as accurate or as precise. And if you click push, it'll send this precision. It'll send all these settings to all the different instances. So if you have like 16 instances open, you can come in and do that. Uh, but yeah, really, really, really handy. But very little detail. So maybe you want something. I've never had a problem with it, but if you do, you're able to come in and make adjustments. Maybe that's too choppy for you. Let's see what six will look like. And away you go. You're cooking with some gas. So let's go ahead. Let's add another analyzer. So there is a really cool one for stereo stuff. The Stereoscope Multi. And same thing, we're gonna set it up. We're gonna go again with instant. Once you know one, you've got pretty much all of them share the same interface, which is really nice. So you learn one, you, you learn them all. And this is our kick. We're gonna go ahead and close this. So here we could see the balance between left and right. And I, this is on the kick, yes, yes, it's on the kick. Why are we not getting something coming through here? It says it's not connected. Did I not connect it? Oh, we have to pick a number. Don't forget to assign it a channel. That's an easy mistake to make. So away you go. We could get in an image to see how things are. Now, if your thing is mono, it's going to appear straight down the center here. And I froze it using this little freeze icon. Wanted to show that because that is a very handy knob to know about. You can actually zoom in on stuff, and if you right-click, it'll zoom you back out. Um, it's actually extremely intuitive, so I really dig that. You also have a difference menu here. So if we come back, let's go ahead, let's add one to the poly KMB. All right, we're going to name this one Synth. Beautiful. We're going to give it a channel. Let's give it channel three. Why not? And we can go to the difference and we can see how they're going to stack up. We'll select synth. So this kick minus synth. And in the different areas, we can see how they stack up in the left, right field. So now this is actually a little more useful to me. And when it comes to masking, because if you've got stuff colliding in the outer edges, that's typically you, you that doesn't matter as much. It's the stuff that's going on in the middle that's going to cause more of the mud typically than the stuff on the edges. The stuff on the edges matters. It just like psychoacoustically, we put more emphasis on the stuff that's in the middle typically. So this is what we would have. And of course, this is the difference of, of kick and synth. So we could see here that the kick just across the entire thing, which makes sense because we saw it on the frequency analyst as well that this held over the entire spectrum of the sound. So it kind of makes sense to see it get pushed down all over. So one option we could do is we could actually grab something that makes a, a boost in the kick, but only on the far sides, mid side processing possibly, and push it up on the sides and maybe on the high end to give it a little extra punch so that the kick is still present throughout most of it, but we still get the body of the synth in the middle. I mean, that's one way you could shape what's going on here. So, all right, so that's the... Uh, stereoscope. There's one more. This one is the oscilloscope. So the oscilloscope is cool because it's got a phase correlation meter. So I think the the balance decisions are better made by the stereoscope. Uh, frequency analysts can reveal some masking stuff. With the oscilloscope, you get an oscilloscope, and this could be cool if you're like doing some sound design or looking for something specific with a wave shape. Uh, but when it comes to mixing and things, what I'll do, and we're going to call this, what are we on the kick channel? I think we're on the kick channel. Yes, we are. 
We'll call this kick left. We'll call this one kick right. And we'll close these. When it comes to this, I think the phase correlation meter is going to be a little more useful typically. We're going to go to blue cat. We're going to go to the oscilloscope multi. We're going to call this synth left. And this one's synth right. And this one has two channels because there is a phase correlation meter in this. So here when we when we uh, push play, and let's just see this. Oh, did I not uh, name stuff? I didn't give them numbers. Okay, we'll open this back up. We're going to give this the numbers 3 and 4. And on the kick, we're going to give these the numbers. Let's bring this up. We'll give these the numbers 1 and 2. Don't forget to give them channels. All right, so we've got a whole bunch of stuff here. I'm going to hide these for now. So this is just the kick left and right. Starts off as your typical scope. And on the scope in particular, the sync mode is extremely handy. We've got trigger, flow, and loop. Loop is probably going to be the one you're going to want to use. It will, uh, let me just show you. So pretty straightforward right there. And the loop just keeps things still so you can actually take a look at it. Feel free to use the freeze function but there is a phase correlation there's an xy plot in here so basically it's one divided by the other and when this is positively correlated it's going to be a line that lines up in these quadrants a positively correlated line when they're negatively correlated they're going to be going in this direction so they'll be in these quadrants all right so knowing what we know about phase correlation now uh, one thing we can do is we can compare the kick channels. I turned off the second curve. And I'm going to go back to flow mode because I think flow mode's a little bit better of a viewing for this sort of a thing. And these are very mono already. The kick right and left are already coming down straight down the center pretty much. So we expect to see an extremely positively correlated curve, something close to a line. And that is what we observe. If we actually make it the same signal, it's 100% correlated. So it should be just a straight line y equals x. Now, if we were to compare it to something else like the synth, this is going, this is wildly moving around in the, uh, when it comes to phase correlation. So what's going to happen is we're going to see stuff begin to come over here, which is going to indicate a very wide image and stuff that will not translate well over like a single speaker. But most of it should still exist for in these two positively correlated regions. Now here we see these large swipes, but these swipes are okay because they're bounced out by what's going on over here. So if you were to crush this down, it would still be all right. What this does tell us is that this is not going to get in the way of this when it comes to knocking around the phase of the kick. Not going to be a problem. Uh, if we compare it to the right, we can get a feel for the actual synth itself and how it's correlated with itself, where it would sit in space if it was played alone. <laughs> So we can see this thing's moving all around. Because it's moving all around, it actually won't be that much of a problem. But if we were to feed in the entire mix into a channel and then put a scope like this up, an XY scope, we would be able to make adjustments according to uh, if our track would translate well over devices that only have a single speaker. Because in those cases, we would lose the stuff that's over here. They would be diminished and the stuff over here would be reinforced. And so if we had a bunch of stuff over here, but not in here or here, that would be evidence of some an element that might disappear in the mix. So this is what you would use this sort of a thing for. And then, of course, you can go back to the scopes. Again, scopes, I think they're really useful for, for creative sound design, checking out and learning what things look like. Um, one thing you do want to keep an eye out for if you're looking at a scope is stuff like, let me just play this. And let's turn on these right here just to show you. All right, so now if we zoom in somewhere, all this like little, these little variations are, are very high frequencies. 
And so when you see very high frequencies going around, if there's a piece of noise you're trying to find, you want to look for areas that are extremely dense like this. This is going to be the giveaway. They're going to be writing bigger frequencies. Like if we take these off and look at the kick, the kick's initial hit has these very crazy, fast, like complicated things going on. That's some stuff you could take away from a scope. You can see that they also ride the lower frequencies, but these ones right here that are really riding it are much less of a problem than the stuff that if stuff like this is appearing and you're looking for noise in your signal, this could be a way to identify what could be causing the issue. Typically though, this would be better suited to a spectrogram, right? Because you'd rather view this in the frequency domain than this is the time domain. You don't want to view this in the time domain. Uh, so oscilloscopes look really cool. But I think you're mostly going to be using the stereoscope frequency analyzer in the phase correlation to make decisions about a mix before you would be checking out what a, a scope has to offer. Uh, to wrap it up too, I just really quick want to show you, you can have both on the screen at the same time. You click this little button right here, the toggle layout. It has this division symbol. And then you can go to and add the XY. So you can get both on your screen going. They do share the mode. So probably going to want to leave it on flow if you're looking at this and unfreeze it. So. so there you go. I am a junkie for analyzers. I love looking at things and when I'm done with the mix, seeing what it looks like, then taking all the effects off, seeing what it looked like before, where my ears led me. So I can attach it to sort of an image, which just creates more connections to me. So that when I listen to something, you know, just more thoughts occur on why I might do something a particular way. Of course, your ears will always be the ultimate deciding factor. But that is a quick introduction to the oscilloscope, the stereoscope, and the frequency analyzer in a multi-channel setting, which to me makes the most sense because, you know, when you're looking at a mix, you're listening to everything at the same time. So you should be looking at everything at the same time. And if you have submixes, it may be wiser to compare the submixes as you go as opposed to individual elements like we're doing right here if you have a very large mix going on. But really, really, really dang cool stuff. If you have any questions about this, feel free to let me know. Subscribe and hit that bell icon for future videos. And have a blessed day.